Hey, it's Ryan at GPI. We're rolling to the fourth installment of our GPI knowledge series. We're going to be talking about Gen 5 LT valve train setup and some of the things we look at setting up a valve train for these applications, um, depending upon the hardware that we have to work with or maybe the hardware that we need to recommend uh, to make a good, happy valve train for the intended usage and RPM range. One of the main things is the cam design. The camshaft is going to dictate the components needed to control the valve train. The more aggressive the camshaft is, you know, the better the components we're going to have to have, like lifters, valve springs, push rods. And then the more tame the, uh, the camshaft design, obviously, we can get away with more budget-friendly um, components because normally that stuff is lower operating RPM and doesn't get beat on quite like the, uh, the higher end stuff does. The next thing is going to be lifters. Uh, that's something we look at a lot with a uh, valve train setup and we have such a wide scope of lifters we can run LS7s, there's some other alternative drop-in LS options, the GMPP race lifters, Johnson's, the drop-in versions and the uh, short travel and link bar options. And each one of these lifters will have their own respective place and usage. We use the GMPP race and the Johnsons more than anything because we do a lot of higher lift, uh, higher RPM applications. And then your more basic stuff where you have lower lift cams, lower RPM range, a lot of the daily driver stuff that's not seen you know, more than about 6,500, 6,600 RPMs, you can get away with LS7s and some of the drop-in LS7, uh, LS1, LS6 alternatives. Uh, so it, it's really relative to what you're trying to do usage-wise, but lifters are a key component in your valve train setup as far as keeping this thing happy for an extended period of time. Push rods, another key component not just because of the length of the push rod to set that lifter preload, but the diameter. Push rods flex, you know, under use. You know, as, the, as it opens up against the valve spring pressure, there is some deflection in the push rod. Got, most guys will default to a 5 16 push rod, and that's normally what will fit without any modification in an LS application. But our Gen 5 LT stuff, we're able to run a 3 8 push rod with no interference issues, and the 3 8 offers much better uh, reduction in, in flex and distortion with our higher spring pressures that we run for higher RPM use and you know that high, that high spring pressure. So it's always good to try to run the largest diameter push rod you can for your application. Sometimes even if you can grind a little bit in your head to to fit that larger diameter push rod, you'll end up with a more stable valve train. And one of the last things is going to be valve springs. Again, several options depending on what your goals and your usage of your setup are going to be. You know, your stock springs, uh, the stock alternative and, and higher performance beehive applications, those are all beehive springs. Conical springs. These are newer technology. They're really picking up uh, in popularity. We've tested some of the stuff and we love what we see with it and we're going to continue to use more of these. And then your dual springs, which um, are basically the industry standard for most of the high performance camshaft applications. Dual springs work well. Uh, they're very affordable and durability wise, you know, the springs we use they have held up great for us. We, we have absolutely no complaints. Um, they all have their own place. You know, we don't need to run a dual spring that's good for 660 lift on one of our low lift truck camshafts that has 540 or 550 lift. In that application, we could run a stock LS3 spring or we could run a, a, a pack beehive spring or a PSI beehive spring you know, that's good for that application and not have to do a dual spring set up with a bunch of hardware that's unnecessary. So that's going to kind of cap off what we, what we look at uh, for hardware that we need to set this valve train up and what's going to determine some of this setup as we go along. 
How do we set up valve train for a given RPM range? What are some things we look at here in more detail? One of the first things we look at is valve mass. Generally speaking, the lighter valve or the lightest valve you can run in your application, the better. As long as the material is suitable for the heat and the power and the, you know, durability wise, it will hold up for what you're trying to do. We wouldn't want to run a stainless or a, a sodium filled exhaust valve in a 2000 horsepower turbo setup. We would probably default to an Inconel setup or maybe even titanium in that application. Uh, we also wouldn't want to run a 120 gram stainless steel intake valve on an 8500 RPM hydraulic roller setup. Yeah. So you have to look at this stuff and, and be sensible about what you're trying to do and understand that the, the valve mass is one of the main things that, that needs to be addressed moving forward to, to get this valve train happy and durable for you to where you can you know, have a, a really durable valve train to, and, and rip that RPM that you need to rip to make the power you want to make. Generally speaking, we run titanium intake valves whenever we can. I know they're expensive, but I think that this is a spot where you don't want to skimp. The lighter the valve you can run, the easier it is for this valve train to stay in control. And it's, it's that simple, really. Lifter selection. So the type of lifter we would use, is, it, it depends a little bit on RPM and spring pressure. If we're putting together a hydraulic roller application that's going to see 7,000 RPM on a plastic intake manifold setup, a pretty standard setup, we're probably not going to run a short travel link bar lifter with 500 pounds of open spring pressure and 180 pounds on the seat. We're probably going to be more along the range of our dual springs that we run that are 150, 160 pounds on the seat and 380 to 400 open pressure. We can get away at that point with uh, the GMPP race or the Johnson 2110R drop-in lifters. We don't have to have anything really extravagant to, to make that combo work. Now, the game changes when we go 7,500 RPM plus and we, we work our way into the 8,000s. Now we need to look at short travel lifters and lifters that are built more durable um, to hold up to these increased spring loads uh, because to get that kind of RPM our open pressures have to, to climb pretty dramatically. I mean we need to see 450 plus open pressure on most of our setups in that RPM range. So we're not going to run a LS7 lifter in an 8500 RPM or even a 7500 RPM hydraulic roller setup, uh, it just doesn't make sense because that's not what that lifter is designed to do. So we have to we have to take that in consideration and be realistic. We, we're not going to put together a combination that is destined to fail. Each one of these lifter options have their their own uh, realm, and when we're really spending these things some RPM and putting some pretty serious valve spring on for a hydraulic roller application. We're going to default to the good lifters, the short travel lifters. And another thing on the lifters, the short travels are nice because you have aerated oil in that lifter and that's like a little shock absorber. So the less travel you have in that lifter, the less valve lift that you lose. You, you, you gain um, power actually through having the shorter travel versus having a hundred thousandths of travel that has a lot more room to squish. So a lot of the trick hydraulic roller uh, high RPM stuff is set up with the, uh, with the preload really, really close to the bottom of the lifter where it doesn't have much room to go before it's bottomed out and you get all of that action at the valve and you're not wasting a bunch of motion. Valve spring selection is gonna depend on RPM, the mass of the valve, and then the rocker design as well. Again, spring selection, there's, there's many options. Our lower lift stuff that's 540, 560 lift for like our truck cams and some of our daily driver style cams. Uh, we're gonna run beehives and stock style springs. You know, the stock LS3 springs are good for, uh, or the stock LT1 springs are good for 550, 560 lift pretty easily. And there's some beehive um, options as well from Pack and PSI that we use 
that are stock replacement style springs in the beehives that work well for the milder stuff. Most of our hydraulic roller stuff is you know, between 620 and 640 lift, up to about 7200 RPM range with factory valves, and we'll run the dual springs on that. And then we have some dual spring options also that are higher RPM capable that we run with our applications that are going 7500 to about 8000 RPMs. And we do some stuff beyond that that's kind of, you know, done on a case by case basis looking at depending on if we're running custom valves or, or anything crazy like that. But the spring selection will depend basically on on what we're needing to do RPM wise and what we're trying to control mass wise. Again, the lighter valves are easier to control for the spring and most of the time you don't want to get away from the factory rocker design and I'll cover that here in a minute. Uh, conical springs are something that that are coming along, technology is, has come along over the last few years for these things and we've tested some. We really like what we see with them and we're probably going to use some more conicals in the future. They work really well, they RPM well, and they're really designed to be able to uh, to carry the mail RPM wise and it's pretty convenient because some of these things you don't have to have a bunch of hardware for. They're, they're pretty basic uh, in design so they're pretty easy to get in and install and not have to have uh, different seats or uh, different locators. Some of them do. And then also some of these conicals can use factory uh, retainers and there's some custom retainers out there but the conicals are pretty cool. What we're going to be using moving forward in the future is going to be good to the mid upper 8000 range and they're really killer because you lose some mass off of the spring up top with that Christmas tree shape and uh, they have a lot of spring rate so you don't have to have a bunch of seat pressure but it has that open pressure that you need to control uh, that valve train at high RPM. The conicals are pretty good. Some people are still scared of conicals and beehives because they're single springs and they think if one breaks it everything's going to fall off in their engine and um, likely not to happen but you know dual springs can break and still tear up stuff as well so that's uh, kind of a uh, something that you know the internet has, has scared people into believing so I would say embrace the technology moving forward conicals are going to be something you're going to see a lot more of uh, moving forward. Rocker arms hardly ever on a hydraulic roller setup on LS and LT stuff do you need to get away from the factory rocker arm. Just put some good trunnions in it we use a lot of the bushing style trunnions uh, you could do the shaft style rocker arm upgrade uh, that uses the stock rocker bodies. You just really just don't need a roller tip on the rocker because it's added weight on the valve that the spring is having to control. And we've tested a lot of these roller rockers and we found that anywhere from three to 500 RPMs sooner than the factory rocker arm, the valve train will start to get out of shape. So that leads you to running, needing to run more spring to try to control this heavier weight and it, it's just not a good trade-off. We've tried you know some aluminum body rockers that are adjustable, we've tried multiple deals and the factory rocker is just it's hard to beat uh, for all these hydraulic roller applications. So we take factory rocker stuff well into the 8000s RPM wise, you just have to keep valve lift reasonable. You don't want to go over about 650, 660 lift on those factory rockers. Uh, a couple more things to look at here are that you see and see people talk about are broken valve seats. Why? Why do the valve seats break? The valve seats aren't garbage. You know, they're not bad. The valve seats break because the valve train is set up poor and more than likely either a combination of your camshaft or running this thing RPM wise beyond where it's intended to run is getting the valve train out of shape and it's just bouncing the valve off the seat beating it to death and it will end up chipping the seat. Uh, it's not that the valve seat is made from a, from a material that's not good, they're, they're fine. The bad valve train dynamics is what kills the valve seats in most cases. 
And you got guide wear. We do see occasionally a little bit of guide wear on the LT engine. Uh, we believe it's because of the 1.8 rocker ratio. You do get a little scrub across the uh, uh, the valve tip with that rocker uh, tip design. Um, and I would just say when the heads are off and you're inspecting this stuff or you're assembling this stuff, just you know, spend the time to measure, look at this guide clearance uh, on the valves and see if you see anything that's out of whack there. There's some specs online that you can grab or you can hit us up and we can kind of tell you what to look for with valve, uh, valve guide spec. And uh, in a case where they're worn, you can replace them with bronze guides or you can just put the, the bronze guide liners in there. We've done both and both work well. But uh, that's just something to look at on some of these 1.8 rocker uh, applications to, uh, to keep that stuff in check. And a couple other things that you'll hear talked about with valve train setup, and you'll see us, we run a lot of titanium valve stuff. And then there's a lot of people that, that run a lot of stainless valve stuff. <laughs> I laugh at this all the time. There's no comparison between titanium and stainless steel. Stainless steel is a budget valve. And titanium is what you run when you want to build a high RPM race setup. There is no substitute for a lighter weight valve. There's nothing you can do to the stainless valve to make it on the level of that titanium valve. Yes, it caught that titanium valve cost about five times or six times as much as that stainless valve. But we believe in doing stuff right, uh, especially in the valve train area. You cannot afford to skimp on this stuff. You need to, to consult with your builder, whether it's us or whoever, um, and talk about this stuff because the last thing you want to do, and we see it all the time with these cylinder head um, packages that, that some other people sell, they're outfitted usually with cheap stainless steel valves because they're trying to hit a price point. We will not do that. We will not put these cheap stainless steel valves that weigh 120, 120 something grams in these heads because they don't belong there. It's just uh, that that's kind of a pet peeve of mine. I don't like it, and it's just a recipe for disaster. Uh, you'll never make that setup happy. And then uh, you know we do some titanium exhaust stuff occasionally on the real high end stuff, but in the LT platform, the sodium filled exhaust valves are actually pretty good. They're pretty durable, especially for the NA stuff. We don't have any failures with those. I wouldn't run them in a, in a setup that's a big turbo setup that was seeing a lot of heat uh, or a big power adder setup that was seeing a lot of heat. I would go to an Inconel exhaust valve at that point. And yes, it's gonna be a little heavier, but um, this is gonna be a necessary trade-off in that application. And lastly, solid roller versus hydraulic roller. Most of the guys with Gen 5 LT stuff, we're going to run hydraulic roller. The solid roller has the capability to blow the hydraulic roller completely out of the water. But to do that, um, it's going to take a setup designed specifically around solid roller, which we do have a CID solid roller head in development. Uh, and it's just going to require being set up around a bunch of valve lift and getting that port to work at the high lift where a solid roller needs to really hump and not set it up like a hydraulic head. You can't build a solid roller on a hydraulic setup and expect to see huge gains. So I hope you guys enjoyed the, uh, the video. Hope you got some good information out of this. These are just some things from our perspective we look at in setting up a valve train. Some of our opinions and beliefs on this. And uh, it's worked well for us. We just want to try to put you guys in the right package the first time around and not put you together a, a combination that's destined to fail. Uh, valve train is a place you don't want to skimp on. You can really lead to some serious damage. You, you just don't want to play around here. Just do this right and uh, do it right the first time. So if you guys like the information, don't forget to like, subscribe, and drop us a comment below and let us know what you think about the video. Thanks.